Gemini is a two-man spacecraft, uh, bigger brother. Behind the crew module is a section that contains the retro rockets, and behind that is a is a rather massive section called the uh, the adapter, and that that's a the word adapter refers to the fact that um, that that uh, together with the retro module, um, you can see that they're kind of expanding in a kind of a, uh, a, a sort of a truncated cone. That's to um, mate the Gemini with the uh, the Titan booster that would launch it into space. So they call it the adapter section because of that. But really, the adapter is more like um, well, it's sort of the equipment section. And it's got the uh, the fuel cells that provide electrical power. It's got the uh, oxygen tanks for the breathing oxygen, and also uh, fuel cells are are uh, powered. They produce electricity by combining uh, oxygen and, and hydrogen, <clears throat> which are stored in tanks in the adapter. And uh, they produce electricity with water as a byproduct. Um, there are maneuvering thrusters, orbital um, attitude control thrusters, and also um, the big thrusters that allow them to change their orbit, and several other uh, pieces of equipment, scientific experiments. Many of them were stored back there. Now, as we go to the next slide here, let's take a look at some, um, some movie clips of Gemini under development. This is the factory floor at the McDonnell Douglas uh, plant in St. Louis, where the Gemini spacecraft were built. Um, and you, here's the ring of thrusters for uh, reentry. You can see them bringing over the section for the parachutes. Here are the retro rockets being fitted in its own individual section. Here's a pretty much completed Gemini spacecraft being transported to a test stand. Um, and now here are two astronauts or two engineers in spacesuits in a mock-up of the Gemini capsule. And you can see it's a pretty cramped environment. It really, uh, in fact, it's got less space, slightly less space per person than Mercury. Um, but, uh, you know, they had to uh, keep the weight of the spacecraft under control because it had to be carried by this uh, Titan missile. Now, this is a, this is a Titan II missile. Um, this is uh, an adaptation for Gemini of the ICBM that was the follow-on to Atlas. One of the drawbacks of Atlas as an ICBM was that it used cryogenic propellants, that is to say, super cold uh, liquid oxygen, you know, of course, in combination with kerosene. But uh, that meant that the Atlas could not be uh, kept ready at a moment's notice for launch in the in the event of a an enemy attack, we needed the, the military needed to develop an ICBM that could be stored, fully fueled, and launched at a moment's notice, and that became the Titan. That was the f the first one that could be stored all over the country in in uh, buried silos, and the thing that made it uh, storable was a different kind of fuel, different kinds of propellants called hypergolic propellants. Um, and these were uh, substances that you could uh, store at room temperature and you could um, combine them and um, they would, uh, they would um, ignite on contact. And that's what the Titan used in its engines. Um, had quite a bit more power than the Atlas and uh, measured, as you can see on the left there, with a Gemini spacecraft, we measure 109 feet. So it's quite a, a sizable rocket. It was a two-stage rocket. Let's take a look at some movie film. This is a Titan II ICBM lifting off on a test. And uh, you can see the uh, distinctive shock patterns in the flame. This is how the engines of the Titan would swivel to steer the vehicle. And here we see the first stage falling away. Uh, during the launch and the second stage igniting to uh, carry the rest of the way. Here is um, a Gemini Titan with uh, different markings. Here's a test flight of the Gemini Titan, uh, unmanned, of course. Uh, 
which proved that the system was ready to launch people. And so we were building up in very methodical steps towards launching the first astronauts aboard Gemini. And that first manned Gemini flight was scheduled for the first months of 1965. However, before Gemini could even get off the ground with, with astronauts, the Soviets scored another first and upstaged Gemini. Uh, it, on October 12th of 1964, they launched a spacecraft that they called Vaskhod. Vaskhod is the Russian word for sunrise. And Vaskhod 1, we were told, was carrying not one cosmonaut, not even two like Gemini would, but three cosmonauts in orbit for a, a day uh, before they landed back in the Soviet Union. And of course, we in the West had no idea of the details of Voskhod. We were only left to speculate. Everybody assumed it must be a very massive ship to carry 30 people. It was only many years later that details began to come out that in fact Vos Voskhod was a converted Vostok. And you can see the diagrams on the upper right there Vostok with its uh, spherical descent module, the crew cabin, with one cosmonaut in his ejection seat. And on the right, the uh, same cabin had been refitted. They, they uh, took away the ejection seat because that was too much, took up too much space and too much weight. They gave the uh, three uh, cosmonauts relatively lightweight uh, couches arranged very uh, cramped in that spherical descent module. You can see it's basically the same vehicle. You can see the instrument panel on the lower right. There's a photo of the actual Voskhod 1 spacecraft that's on display at a museum in Moscow. You can see in the back there the porthole and the instrument panel that uh, in Vostok the cosmonaut would have been facing. But in this case it was off to the side and on the upper left there you can see a pre-flight photo of the three astronauts um, as they would be during the flight. Um, this was kind of risky to say the least, launching three people without any kind of an escape system, no ejection seats, no escape tower, not even any spacesuits. And of course, again, we in the West were unaware of these risks um, and it was yet another Soviet space spectacular that was the first multi-person space flight um, in uh, several months before Gemini could even launch two astronauts. Now that was not all the Soviets had up their sleeve. In March of 1965, and this was just days before we were scheduled to launch our first Gemini, they launched a second Voskhod. This carried two cosmonauts, Pavel Belyaev and Alexei Leonov, and again, a converted Vostok, this time uh, with spacesuits uh, and an addition of a collapsible inflatable airlock. You can see Alexei Leonov um, uh, egressed through that airlock, became the first human to walk in space. And you can see in the motion picture film here, Leonov squeezing his way through that inflatable airlock and uh, emerging into the vacuum of space. This is images from a television camera attached to the side of the vehicle. He's got no way of uh, controlling his uh, motion except to grab on to the tether that he's attached to. Here he is floating away from the ship. He's wearing a set of uh, mirrored goggles that shield his eyes from the intense sunlight of space. He was only outside for about 10 minutes and you can see him here, he's just kind of floating around. His uh, suit was very stiff, and he in fact had quite a hard time squeezing back into that inflatable airlock. And the only way he got back inside was to actually let some of the air out of his suit with a valve. And that risked getting decompression sickness, otherwise known as the bends, which could have killed him. But uh, it turned out it was okay, and there was another Soviet space spectacular before the first man Gemini flight. 